our worship service this evening, and we trust that God will bless us as we meet together in public worship. We begin our service in singing praise, Psalm 102, Psalm 102, and the B version of the psalm, and we sing stanzas one to four. We've been looking uh, this morning and the last time I was here at Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And this is a psalm again that speaks of that building work, the building of the Church of Christ. Thou shalt arise and mercy yet, thou to Mount Zion shall extend. Her time for favour which was set, behold, is now come to an end. Thy saints take pleasure in her stones, her very dust to them is dear. All heathen lands and kingly thrones on earth, thy glorious name shall fear. God in his glory shall appear when Zion he builds and repairs. He shall regard and lend his ear unto the needy's humble prayers. The afflicted's prayer he will not scorn. All times this shall be on record and generations yet unborn shall praise and magnify the Lord. We sing this se section of, uh, of God's word and we sing to the tune Duke Street number 10. So that's Psalm 102, B version 1 to 4 and the tune is number 10. Let's join together and sing praise to God. for the care and concern that you have for your church. We thank you that the church is not of human invention. It is not of something that was desired by man, but it is your church. You have established it. You have caused it to come into being right from the beginning of the creation of man. And we thank you, Lord God, that you have brought the church through all the different problems and difficulties there were in the Old Testament as the people sought to keep your law and walk in your ways, looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. And we thank you, Lord God, that in due time you brought the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. And we thank you that you brought him to be the saviour of your elect. 
And our gracious God, we thank you that the same Lord Jesus said to us that he would build his church and nothing would be able to stand in its way. And we bless you for the church. We confess that very often the church has not been what it ought to be. We confess that sometimes the church has been anything but a holy institution. But, O oh Lord our God, we thank you that in spite of the wickedness of men, in spite of the unfaithfulness of those who have professed your name, we thank you that you go on building your church. And we thank you, gracious God, that you will continue that work until the church is brought together in its entirety in the glory of heaven. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are but a very small part of that great church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the privilege that we have of meeting together as a group of your people, as a small part of your universal church. And we thank you that you have brought us together to worship you, the living God. May we do so in spirit and in truth. We confess our sin. We, even in our worship, we do not worship as we ought. O oh Lord God, have mercy upon us, we pray. Grant us the help of your Holy Spirit that this evening as we come to worship, we may be able to worship in such a way that your own great name is glorified and uplifted and Christ Jesus uplifted in our midst. And we do pray for the church universal. We thank you for the church to which we belong. We thank you, Lord God, for the universal spread of the Reformed Presbyterian Church. And we thank you, Lord God, for the way that that church has expanded and grown in recent years. And we do praise you for that. And we pray for our brethren in many different parts of the world, speaking many different languages. And we pray, Lord God, that your good hand would be upon them, that you would cause them to glorify you in their worship and in their work and in their living. And we ask, O oh Lord God, that the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, to which we belong, would grow to the honour and glory of your name, but not just our own denomination. Lord God, we would not be so insular. We would pray for your church, wherever it, wherever it happens to be, by whatever name it calls itself. We pray, Lord God, that wherever there are your people, those who worship you in spirit and truth, those who seek to glorify your name. O oh Lord God, bless them. Do them good. We pray especially for those who suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. We pray that you would strengthen them and uphold them. And may the witness that they have bear testimony to those who persecute them. We remember how the testimony of Stephen was used in the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And our loving Heavenly Father, we pray that for our brethren, not known to us by name, but known to you, that suffer persecution for the cause of Christ, we pray that you would make them shining witnesses, that even in their persecution and suffering, we pray that they may be used to the extension of the kingdom of Christ. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies which are new each day. We thank you for this, the Lord's Day. What a great privilege it is to be able to meet together with your people in public worship. May we never despise it. May we never look down upon it. May we always look forward to the Sabbath day, the day of rest and the day of worship. May it be for us as it was for the people in Israel May we be able to say, I joyed when to the house of God go up, they said to me. Loving Heavenly Father, be pleased to meet with us. We pray that you would pardon our sin, that you would deal kindly and graciously with us. And as we come to worship, Lord God, we pray as we read your word, as we seek to meditate upon it, we pray that you would open our eyes that we might see wonderful things in your law. Hear us, we pray, and pardon sin. We ask it in Jesus' name.
Amen. Now, this evening we're going to read two passages uh, or two portions uh, from one particular chapter of the scripture. It will be of no surprise to most of you that that will be chapter 3 of Nehemiah. Sometimes when we're reading through the Bible, we come to chapters that seem to be nothing but a list of names. And we wonder, really, is there any point in reading them? In our family worship, fairly recently, we've been reading through the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Numbers. And it seems that page after page after page is of different uh, generations of different families. And you sometimes think, is it really worth reading these things? And yet, all these things are there because God wants them to be there. And everything in God's word is for our good, it's for our benefit, it's for our edification. So we're going to read from Nehemiah chapter 3, and we're going to read, first of all, the first 16 verses and when I was looking at this I thought there's some strange names here and I thought I might mispronounce them but then I was reminded that if I don't pronounce, pronounce them right nobody else will either so it doesn't really matter. So chapter 3 Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests and built the sheep gate they consecrated it and hung its doors. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it, then as far as the Tower of Hananiel. Next to Eliashib, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri, built. Also, the sons of Hasenawa built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with, with its bolts and bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kos, made repairs. Next to them, Mishalom, the son of Berechiah, the son of Mehezabel, made repairs. Next to them, Zadok, the son of Baana, made repairs. Next to them, the Tekoites made repairs. But their, no their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of the Lord. Moreover, Jehoiada, the son of Pasio and Meshalem, the son of Besudaya, repaired the old gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Next to them, Melatiah, the Gibeonite, Jadon, the Mer uh, Meronothite, the men of Gibeon and Mizpah, repaired the residence of the governor of the region beyond the river. Next to him, Uziel, the son of uh, Hahiah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs. Also next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, made repairs, and they fortified Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Next to them, Rephiah, the son of Hur, leader of the half of the district of Jerusalem, made repairs. Next to them, Jediah, the son of uh, Harumaph, made repairs in front of his house. And next to him, Hattush, the son of Hashabaniah made repairs. Malkaija, the son of Harim, and Hashub, the son of Pahath Moab, repaired another section, as well as the tower of the ovens. Next to him was Shalom, the son of Halohesh, leader of half the district of Jerusalem. He and his daughters made repairs. Hanun and the inhabitants of Zanoa repaired the valley gate, they built it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars, and repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the refuse gate. Malkaija, the son of Rechab, leader of the district of Beth Hakarem, repaired the refuse gate. He built it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Shalom, the son of Kolhose, Kol leader of the district of Mizpah, 
repaired the fountain gate. He built it, covered it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars, and repaired the wall of the pool of Shelah by the king's garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, leader of half the district of Beth Zur, made repairs as far as the place in front of the tombs of David to the man-made pool and as far as the house of the mighty. And we finish our reading there and we'll take it up in a moment and complete the rest of the chapter. Now I'm going to read from the book of praise from our Psalter from Psalm 147. Psalm 147, the B version of the psalm. Psalm 147, the B version of the psalm, and reading the four stanzas that are there. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good praise to our God to sing, for it is pleasant, and to praise it is a comely thing. God doth build up Jerusalem, and he it is alone that the dispersed of Israel doth gather into one. Those that are broken in their heart and grieved in their minds he healeth, and their painful wounds he tenderly upbinds. He counts the number of the stars, he names them, every one. Great is our Lord, and of great power, his wisdom search can none. Amen. Now we return to Nehemiah chapter 3, at verse 17. Verse 17 of Nehemiah 3. After him, the Levites under Rehum, the son of Bani, made repairs. Next to him, Hashabiah, leader of half the district of Keilah, made repairs for his district. After him, their brethren, under Bavai, the son of Henadad, leader of the other half of the district of Keilah, made repairs. Next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the leader of Mizpah, repaired another section in front of the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, diligently repaired the other section from the buttress to the door of the house of Eliashiv, the high priest. After him, Meremoth, the son of uh, <coughs> Urijah, the son of Kos, repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. And after him, the priests, the men of the plain, made repairs. After him, Benjamin and Hashub made repairs opposite their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Messiah, the son of Ananiah, made repairs by his house. After him, Binui, the son of Henadad repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress, even as far as the corner. Palal, the son of Usai, made repairs opposite the buttress and on the tower which projects from the king's upper house that was by the court of the prison. After him, Bediah, the son of Parosh, made repairs. Moreover, the Nethinim, who dwelt in Ophel made repairs as far as the place in the front of the water gate towards the east and on the projecting tower. After them, the Tekoites uh, repaired another section next to the great projecting tower and as far as the wall of Ophel. Beyond the horse gate, the priests made repairs, each in front of his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Immer, made repairs in front of his own house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, 
made repairs. After him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanun, the sixth son of Zelaph, repaired another section. After him, Mishalem, the son of Bechariah, made repairs in front of his dwelling. After him, Malchiah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the Nethinim and of the merchants in front of uh, <coughs> the Mifkad gate and as far as the upper room at the corner. And between the upper room at the corner, as far as the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants made repairs. <coughs> and we give thanks to God for these readings of his inspired and infallible word. <clears throat> now it might seem, as we read these, uh, these verses in chapter 3, that chapter 3 is simply a record of those who took, play, took part in this building project and therefore is nothing more than of historical interest. But that, however, is far from the truth. For there are many spiritual lessons that we can learn uh, from this chapter. Nehemiah, you remember we looked at this morning how Nehemiah walked around the whole of the city uh, looking at each section and seeing what needed to be done. And it, certainly one of, the, one of the things that he was doing was looking at the gates and he going from gate to gate where the entry points to the city were to discover which was most vulnerable to attack because it was there that they needed to be strengthened. So what we're going to look at first of all in verses 1 to 5 is a work of strengthening. A work of strengthening. And several gates are mentioned here. The sheep gate was so described, quite naturally, because that's where the shepherds brought their sheep into Jerusalem in order to sell them. And it's interesting that it was here that the high priest and his fellow priests labored. Now, it must have been a tremendous encouragement to the people to see their spiritual leaders involved in leading the work. They didn't sit back and urge other people to do it, but they actually joined in with the work. And not only joined in, but they were the leaders. They were the first ones to go into the breach. They were the first ones to go to this ruined gate and to begin to construct it. And it is significant that Eliashib is the first person mentioned. He led in the work, and more than 50 others are mentioned who followed him. And you notice something else significant here, that when the gate had been rebuilt, when the, the gate was, uh, and the doors were properly hung once again, the first thing that they do is they consecrate it to the Lord. And this demonstrated that this work was not just a work, a work in order to make the city secure, but it was something that was done for the honour and glory of God. And are we not told in, in Colossians chapter 3, the letter of Paul to the church in Colossae, Colossians and chapter 3, a verse that we probably all know very well. Chapter 3 and verse 17, it says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And this is what this priest and the other people that followed him, that's what they did. They did the building for the honour and glory of God. Remember what Nehemiah had said earlier. He said, the reason we need to do this building 
is so that the name of our God will not be despised. So the name of our God will not be blasphemed. This work of building was for the glory of God. But you notice the progression. Not only was the gate rebuilt, but the walls linking it to the next gate, because this city, as we saw this morning, was uh, uh, the wall was all the way around it. So there was a gate, then there was a wall, then there was a gate. And so they not only built the walls, but they re-strengthened the walls in order to protect the city. And then we come to the fish gate, so-called because it was near the fish market. And this was built by one family and other families worked at making repairs, as we see in verse 4. Next to them, Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz, made repairs. Next to them, Meshalem, the son of Berechiah, uh, <coughs> made repairs, and so on. Now we'll have a look at this a, a little bit later on. And it's interesting that the word, the Hebrew word for repairs, is the word kazakh, and it's used 35 times in this chapter alone. And this word, this Hebrew word, has the idea of strengthening, <coughs> strengthening, encouraging, of making something strong. And this is obviously something that is very needful in the church of Jesus Christ. You see, when we see the, the strengthening of Jerusalem, we remember that Jerusalem was the city of God. This was the place where God had set his name. And so I think we're quite justified in looking at what happened in Jerusalem as being applicable to the church of Jesus Christ as well. And to strengthen, to encourage, to make something strong, that is a work that needs to continually be done in the church of Jesus Christ. We need to encourage one another. We need to strengthen one another. We are, we are to make the church of Jesus Christ strong. Now we could take a whole series of sermons on how to make the church of Jesus Christ strong. But we need to make the church strong by sound doctrine, by godly living, and by firm and vigorous fellowship amongst the believers. And we strengthen the church when we take care of these issues. And this is what Nehemiah was attempting to do by getting all these people to to, to cooperate, to collaborate in strengthening the walls of the city. And the encouraging thing that we have in this chapter is that many, many people were involved (coughs) in (coughs) the strengthening work that was being done. There's an interesting note here about the men of Tekoa. The men of Tekoa joined in vigorously with the work, but it's interesting to note that their nobles did not join with them. We read that they would not bend their necks to the work. work. In other words, they would not submit to the Lord or do any work for the Lord. And sadly... Just as that was the case in Jerusalem, so it is in the professing church. There are too many people in the church who are quite prepared to sit back and watch other people doing the work. There are many in any work for the Lord. There are always some who just want to stand on the sidelines and watch. And sadly, it is often those who stand on the sidelines that criticize the most. Those who do nothing, who criticize the most. 
We shall see as we go through this chapter that the construction of the walls, the rebuilding of the walls, was a collaborative work and it involved all sorts of different people. And so it is within the Church of Jesus Christ. It is not without accident, and we'll look at this again in a moment, it's not without accident that the New Testament speaks about the Church as being a body. It speaks as be, of being of different abilities and different, uh, different capabilities within the church. Uh, the eye cannot say to the ear, I don't need you. We all need one another. And that's the message that came here. And so the men of Tekoa got stuck into the work, but their nobles stayed behind and watched. So that's the first thing. It was a work of strengthening. Then from verses 6 to 12, we have a work of building. A work of building. When we read the list of those who willingly engaged in the work of rebuilding the walls and the strengthening of the city, there are some very interesting insights that we want to have a look at. First of all, these people were not professional builders. There was a goldsmith, there were a number of goldsmiths, there were perfumers. But the important thing about all these different people, there were priests, there were Levites, there were people of all sorts of professions, but the interesting thing and the important thing is that they were willing. They were willing to do the work. Now, I have no doubt that if they brought in a team of builders, they could have done the work better. They could have perhaps made the work look neater and tidier but they weren't there to do it. It was the people who were there to do it who did the work. Those who may have had limited ability, but a passion to see the work of God progress will accomplish far more than a talented and a gifted person with no passion and no heart for the work. I have been many years in the church. I've been involved for decades and decades in the work of the church, both at home and overseas. I don't pretend for one moment that any of the work in which I've been engaged could not have been far better done by somebody else. I have no question about that. I acknowledge that my ability is strictly limited. And yet, and yet, God enabled me to do it because I was willing to do it. And that's what God desires from us he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily uh, desire to have people who are extremely talented. Now, if you are extremely talented, the Lord will use you. But he doesn't require people who are supremely talented. He requires people who are, living, who are willing and people who have a heart for the work. And that's what these people had zeal for the Lord and a willing desire to glorify him are the essential requirements for building the wall of Jerusalem, for building the church of Jesus Christ, a heart for the work, willingness and zeal. Oh yes, there will be other people who could do it far better than you, of course. I could think of dozens of people who would be far better 
at bringing a sermon to you good folks here in Carrick Fergus. But they're not here. You see the point? It's the willing. And that's what we see in this chapter, that it was the willing who did the work. There's another interesting thing that we see here. Those who had leadership responsibilities in the community did not delegate the work to others. If you look at chapter 3, you'll see a number of people are described as being the leaders in a particular area. Verse 9, for example, and next to them, uh, Rephiah, the son of Hur, leader of half the district of Jerusalem. Next to them, uh, Jediah, the son of uh, Haru, ha, uh, Harumfa, Harumaf, made repairs in front of his house. Next to him, Hattush, and so on. There were people who were leaders in the community. Now, what we would often expect here, if someone is a leader, they delegate somebody else to do it. Not there. They did it themselves. They joined, they didn't just delegate the work to other people, they joined with them in the hard physical work. One commentator makes this particular point. He says, an inactive leadership is no leadership at all. An inactive leadership is no leadership at all. And these men who were leaders in their community, yet they got stuck into the work and did the hard physical labor as well. Four times, this is another point, four times in chapter three, men are mentioned who made repairs in front of their own houses. Uh, Jediah in verse 10, Benjamin in verse 23, Zadok verse 29, and Mishalem in verse number 30. Now that's a very important lesson for us. Now we might think, well of course you would build in front of your own house, because that would, that would protect your own house, so it's a sensible thing to do. But there is a spiritual lesson for us here. In any work of spiritual restoration, care must be given to strengthen the home life of the people. These people's houses were being strengthened because they were strengthening the wall. And we all have a responsibility in our own families to strengthen our home lives. You see, a church is made up of families. Of course we have individuals from families, of course we do. But by and large, a congregation is made up of families. Not always complete families, but there are parents and there are children. There are, of course, homes where there is only one person living. It's still a home. And those homes need to be strengthened. And the, strength, the, the stronger the home lives in the congregation are, excuse me, the stronger the home lives in the congregation are, the stronger will be the congregation. I think, sadly, in many professing Christian homes today, the concept of family worship has gone out of the window. People are too busy to have family worship, too busy to sing together, too busy to read the scriptures together, too busy to pray together. And that's sad, isn't it? Because family worship strengthens the relationship not only between the members of the family, 
but it strengthens the relationship with God. We begin the day with God. Now, I know for some people, they leave for work early in the morning and it's difficult uh, to have family worship before going to work. I know that. But there ought to be time then at the end of the day for there to be family worship. We have, because uh, we're now officially retired, we have the luxury of having time in the morning so we can meet together before breakfast and we can sing a psalm together, we can read the scriptures together and we can pray. And it kind of sets you up for the day. Family worship is vitally important. In, in Presbyterian and Reformed families in a past generation, this was a given. And when families were visited by the minister or by the elders, then they were quizzed about their family worship. How does your family practice family worship? What passages are you going through now? And so on. Because it was a given that people would have family worship. I wonder, even in our own denomination, I wonder what emphasis there is on family worship. It is important to strengthen in front of our homes, as these people here did. We need to strengthen the home life of our people. But there's something else here, that Malkijah, the son of Hadim, is mentioned. <coughs> <coughs> and this is not the only place where he's mentioned in the scripture. He's also mentioned in Ezra, chapter 10, and verse 31. But there he was rebuked for having taken a pagan wife. There were a number of people in the return, uh, returned exiles who then uh, married foreign women, women who were not part of the people of Israel. But the interesting thing here is that although he was rebuked for his past sin, his past sin did not prevent him from now serving the Lord. And that's important to know. Past sin must be repented of. And past sin must be left behind. But it must not be allowed to stand in the way of future service. We should not be as those we should not be those who, because a man or a woman sins once, to our knowledge, that we then write them off forever and a day. Because somebody fails in some work that they undertake for God, we must never disqualify them from ever doing anything in the, in the future in case they fail again. You see, God doesn't treat us like that. How many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? No. Seventy times seven, said Jesus. And so here we have this man, Malkijah, that although he received the, abuse, the, the rebuke from Ezra, yet later on, in the time of Nehemiah, he is listed as those who put their shoulder to the wheel one of those who engaged in the work of the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem. And another thing here in the building is that everybody who was able joined the work. <clears throat> I love the verse that says, Shalom and his daughters made repairs. Isn't that a wonderful thing to see? in the scriptures. Building work is man's work, isn't it? Not when it comes to building the church. No, 
That's the work of Shalom and his daughters. Here there is an indication of the willingness of everybody to do whatever they could to help with the work. Sadly, sometimes there are those in the church who do not think they have anything to contribute. Over the years of my ministry, I've heard it said over and over again, I have nothing to offer. And isn't that sad? Now, there are different roles within the church. We do not believe, for example, that, that women should be elders or ministers. That's what the scripture tells us. But it doesn't mean they cannot be involved in the work of ministry. Of course it doesn't. It doesn't mean that they sit on their hands when the walls of Jerusalem are being built. Of course not. You remember when Paul talks about the church, he talks about there being many different members and that not every member has the same function. Not everyone is able to do the same work. <clears throat> but all those who are the children of God have something to contribute to the advancement of the cause of Christ. I wonder, do we, ever, do we ever think about the contribution that people make to the work of the ministry and the work of the gospel by those who pray, those who pray in their homes, by themselves, unseen by anyone except God, and yet they pour out their hearts to God for the work of the ministry. Or they, they, may come to the, they may come to the worship services and they sit in the same seat and they, they're almost unrecognized by anybody. And yet they are spiritual warriors for God. And they do a work that cannot be overestimated. You see, the lesson here is not that everybody did the same work, but that everybody men and women, did what they could. You see, we make a great mistake if we assume that everyone has to do the same thing within the work of the church. They don't. We go out sometimes knocking on doors, talking to people. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody is comfortable doing that. Not everyone is able to do it. And we shouldn't expect them to do so. Sometimes we have, perhaps not here, but in other congregations, what they call street ministry. Standing on the street and speaking to people. I've tried it. I'm hopeless. Absolutely hopeless. I don't know why. Maybe my fearsome appearance scares people off. I don't know. But I'm hopeless at it. And I know other people who would never stand up in a pulpit and preach. And yet they're brilliant. They manage to get people talking. They managed to engage with them. Now I've stood up in the marketplace and preached in the open air. I have no great difficulty with that. But stopping people on the street to speak to them, I'm worse than useless. But there are other people who can do it. What we need to do within our church is to find what people can do and what people are comfortable in doing and 
It's not that everybody does the same work, but that everybody, men and women, do what they can. So that's the work of building. And then from verses 13 to 32, we have a work of cooperation. A work of cooperation. And the rest of the third chapter gives us a list of all those who worked uh, on and around the remaining gates. The valley gate, the refuse gate, the fountain gate, the water gate, the horse gate, and the assembly gate. So they were doing these main entrances first, and then they spread out and did all the ones round about. And there are several things that we learn again from here. The restoration was to be a complete one. No gaps were to be left, and no part of the structure was to be left unstrengthened or unrepaired. What did Nehemiah do first of all? He walked around and he had a look. And he had a look to see what needed to be strengthened, where the work needed to be done. He did a careful examination first. And that is what we are to do as we seek to rebuild the church. No part is to be left unstrengthened or unrepaired. And the work of spiritual restoration in the church is to be a complete one. I suggest there are four things that need to be taken care of in this spiritual restoration or the complete spiritual restoration of the church. There is to be sound doctrine. I know doctrine sometimes is a dirty word, but doctrine simply means the truth about God, the truth about God. There needs to be sound doctrine. And sound doctrine needs to be preached. Now, I'm not talking about ministers giving great theological discourses that ordinary people simply can't understand. Now, I'm very thankful I'm just an ordinary person. I'm thankful that it's not possible for me to give these great theologically um, diverse and complex um, talks. But doctrine, the doctrine about God, who God is, what God is, what he has done, God's work, the Lord Jesus Christ, his work of sacrifice on the cross, the redemption that comes alone through him, his resurrection and ascension, and his coming again. Sound doctrine is an important pillar in the church. But that sound doctrine must be accompanied by loving fellowship. That's the second thing. One of the characteristics of the early church was their loving fellowship. You remember that in the early church, they shared everything they had. They met together, and where somebody had want or need, that need was met. They shared together. They were one body in Christ. We can have sound doctrine and it can be sterile. It can be extremely sterile. But where that is accompanied by loving fellowship, then it's something that is to be heartily desired. But not only sound doctrine and loving fellowship, there must also be spiritual worship. Worship that glorifies God. Worship that does not have man at its center, but has God at its center. It does not seek to, to magnify the gifts and the abilities of men, but directs all of its attention to the glory of God. And so we have the kind of worship that God requires of us in his word. 
Why do we sing only psalms in our church? Because we're old fashioned? Because we don't move with the times? Because we can't stand guitar music? Is that, is that why we sing only psalms? No. We sing psalms because we're commanded to do so in the scripture. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, uh, verse 19, I think, um, we're commanded to sing psalms. And where it says psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, the word spiritual uh, actually applies to all of those words. It should be that we are to sing spiritual songs, spiritual psalms and spiritual hymns. And the word spiritual means spirit given, given by the spirit. And so what are the psalms and songs and hymns given by the Holy Spirit? They're here in the 150 psalms. That's why we sing psalms. Because that's what God requires of us. And so that's why we sing them. Our worship is to be God-centered and God-directed. So sound doctrine, loving fellowship, spiritual worship, and the fourth, the fourth thing is zealous outreach. Zealous outreach. We can sit in our own little holy huddle and we can... And we can have sound doctrine, we can have good worship, we can have good fellowship amongst ourselves. But it mustn't stop there. It must go out into the community in zealous outreach. Now there are many different ways in which that outreach can be carried out. That's not the point. But the point is these things should be characteristic of the church of Jesus Christ. And if we are to restore the church to what it ought to be, then this restoration must be a complete one. The second thing in the work of cooperation, once again, the variety of people involved in the building work is striking. If you read through that chapter, there were officials, those who were responsible for a half of a part of the city or whatever, there were Levites, there were priests, there were temple servants, goldsmiths, merchants, all joining together for the common good. And the great lesson is, in this is, is very characteristic of the New Testament. Diversity in unity. You see, that's the church. Diversity in unity. There is one church with many members in such passages as Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 where Paul speaks of the body of Christ and of members in particular. Now this means that we all have different functions to fulfill. And no one function is more important than any other. And no person who carries out a particular function is more important than anyone else. The church is one. And the church is made up, as the body is, of many different parts. Think about the human body. And that's what Paul compares the church to, the human body. Now we can probably function with only one eye. But it's not optimal, is it? We can function with only one leg, but we don't walk as well. There are many parts of the body that we can do without. But we talk about the body being disabled. I wonder how often the church is disabled because not every part is working together because every part is not functioning as it should. We all have different functions to fulfill and different contributions to make to the whole. And that's what was going on here. <clears throat> and there's a couple of other things I want to mention 
in regard to this section. There was one man, his name was Baruch, Baruch the son of Zabdi, a Zabai, in verse 20, is said to have done his work carefully or zealously. And although it seems that everybody worked with a will, Baruch is is picked out in particular for the character of his work. Isn't that something? Isn't that a great memorial? That all these people were working willingly, they were working zealously, but this man Baruch was working zealously for the work. And this seems to exemplify the teaching of Colossians. Turn with me to the uh, to the letter of Paul to the church in Colossae and the third chapter. The third chapter of Colossae, of Colossians, at verse 17, I mentioned this before. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then go on to verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And that applies, that applies to every part of the work of the church. It applies to the preaching of the gospel. It applies to the teaching in Sabbath school. It applies in the cleaning of the church building. It applies in every part of the work that we do for God, that it is to be done with heart and soul and mind and strength. There is also mention <clears throat> of the men of Tekoa, who were not satisfied with building a section of the wall around the fish gate in verse 5. They also set to building another series of the wall around the water gate in verse 27. And when there is a heart for the work of the Lord, nothing is too much trouble. You see, the, these men from Tekoa, they could have sat back and said, look, we've done our bit. We've, we've done the bit down at the fish gate. It's up to somebody else now. But you see, they saw that there was a work that yet to be done. So they said, we'll do that as well. And no work for the Lord is too much trouble. The people were working hard to rebuild the walls and both nobles and people were cooperating together in order to improve the safety and security of their community. There was almost a universal willingness for the residents of Jerusalem to work together in spite of all the social, economic and other differences that there were between them. I'm going to finish with a fairly extensive quote from James Philip. As some of you know of uh, James Philip. James and George Philip uh, were two brothers in Glasgow, and they both served uh, faithful ministries in the city of Glasgow. And James Philip, in his 1995 Bible readings on the book of Nehemiah, makes this very useful comment, and with this I finish. Furthermore, everyone was next to someone else. And obviously, they could not all have been congenial companions. In other words, they were side by side with somebody perhaps they didn't get on with, but they were there working. And he says, But it is certain that Nehemiah did not have time to be scuttling around trying to make sure that abrasive personalities would not be rubbing against one another. One does not have time for that sort of luxury when there is danger in the air and there is work to be done. So the most diverse types had to work alongside each other. Priests alongside the men of Jericho Jericho, the city, you remember, that had been destroyed and, 
uh, God had said that it was not to be rebuilt, but it was rebuilt. That two had gone away into exile and maybe uh, three or four hundred <coughs> people of Jericho came back and their descendants were those who worked here. But working, working alongside uh, working as, alongside the priests probably was not the thing that they would prefer to have done. Rulers alongside commoners. And he says, this is the great enriching quality in the church of God. This is the true meaning of fellowship. The coming together of people, all different to one another, all unequal to one another, and therefore, because unequal, utterly dependent on one another. I think that's a great quote from James Phillips. And it's sad when those who are one in their doctrinal understanding allow personal disagreements or differences to disrupt the, the, the work of the gospel. The Church of Jesus Christ and individual congregations of God's people have a great task to perform. It's essential that we learn from Nehemiah and seek to work together for the advancement of the kingdom of Christ and the salvation of lost sinners. Nehemiah has a lot to teach us. Let's just bow together for a moment. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that even in some of the passages that seem to be perhaps uh, the least good for teaching, we thank you that in these passages there is much to teach us about how we should, how we should work for you, how we should live for you. Gracious God, we pray that you would help us to work together, each fulfilling whatever they can to seek that the Church of Christ here becomes strong and robust. O oh Lord our God, we thank you that you have promised all grace and all strength to enable us to do a task that seems so often to us almost impossible. But we thank you that the building is yours. The building is for your honour and your glory. Help us to see that and help us to do what we can for the advancement of the cause of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Our, <clears throat> our closing psalm is Psalm 127. Psalm 127. And the tune is Syracuse number 166. <clears throat> Psalm 127. <clears throat> Unless the Lord will build the house, the builders toil in vain. Unless the Lord the city keeps, the guard will watch in vain. Your rising, <clears throat> your rising early is in vain. Late hours you vainly keep to eat the bread that's gained by toil. He gives his loved ones sleep. We sing verses 1 to 4 of Psalm 127 and the tune 166. Let's join together in praise to God.
receive the blessing of the Lord. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>